Hey, kids, how are you? Um, if you know me or have known me for any length of time, you know that I often will say hello to kids, right? I mean, hey, kids. And, and some, it's really nice because some people who are uh, older than me always say, oh, thank you. That's so nice of you. And it's like, oh, it has nothing to do with your age. Um, but I'll say it if, if you like it. It has everything to do with the fact that we are literally children of God and we never grow up from being a child of the one true king, the father of our Savior Jesus. And so it's like, hey, hey, kids. And so when I hear that song, it's like, ah, oh, uh, we're just kids coming together, having like a big play date. All right. Um, it was funny. Uh, last night I got home kind of late and um, I just put a new tile on my keys so I can find them. You know, that little tile thing where you can find everything because I lose everything. And so this morning when I woke up, I was looking for my keys. And so I'm on my phone. I'm clicking it, you know, making it chirp. And I'm not hearing it. And so I walk out to my truck and notice that, of course, the um, locks are all pushed down. And I, and I hear the chirping coming from inside the truck. And I went, okay, where are the other three sets of my keys? Oh, yeah, they're in the truck. That's great. So, yeah, it was an eventful morning. Um, but welcome to One Hope, and we're so glad you're here on Memorial Day. Memorial Day. Um, it's funny. We, uh, I always have a hard time talking about Memorial Day uh, because we had a family member in the last couple of years pass away, um, was killed in Afghanistan. So I don't, I don't even like to talk about it. And, and that, I got to get over that because um, some of you probably have family members who also um, sacrificed their lives. And so I just want to, you know, if you had someone in your family, and, and many of, like my mom, I think four of her brothers died in the war, uh, the Second World War. And so um, I know it's for those of us who are older children of God, that's, that's maybe more um, pronounced. And so I'm just going to say a prayer and... Um, and we're going to take communion later. We're also going to celebrate the fact that uh, there was one who gave his life so that we could have freedom beyond any kind of freedom we have in this country. Um, so, but it, I always think of the, the sacrifice people have made for their country. It's such a similar place. You know, it's like, wow, they really gave the ultimate price just like our Savior did. And so we're just going to pray for a second. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you being reminded of the fact that there are people who who gave their life so that we could come here in freedom and worship you and, uh, and live in this country and have the incredible freedoms that we do have. Uh, it was all really paid by a, an ultimate price. And so uh, we pause in just a moment of gratitude and remembrance because I know that people have been affected by that. And... Uh, we would never want to take it for granted what we have here. And so thank you for their sacrifice. Thank you also for your son's sacrifice that allows us to get to know you, to, to worship you as your children. And uh, we say we love you, and we, we're just amazed at what, what people will do for us. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, it, that never goes the way I think it's going to go because it hits me, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, a friend of mine, uh, sorry, that, that's like, that just like took all the air out of the place, didn't it? Now I have to, to pump it back up. And like, I, I'm not interested in pumping it back up. We'll just go through the scripture. Um, why don't I just get right to the, the passage of scripture? We've been in Hebrews for a long time. We're talking about sacrificial love, the idea of, of Christ's sacrifice for us. And throughout these last couple chapters, we've been really hitting it hard that the old sacrificial system was there, but it was really just a shadow. And that's what the text will say today. It was just a shadow of what was to come in Christ's perfect sacrifice. So let's just go right into Hebrews chapter 10. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifice under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt 
would have disappeared. But instead, these sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it's not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's when my iPad just stops. That is why, oh, I think I missed the verse. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. And then I said, and he's putting this in the lips of Jesus, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. First, Christ said, here's an explanation. First, Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they are required by the law of Moses. And then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. And there he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. And this verse is probably the most important verse in this little chunk. For by that one offering, Jesus, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I'll write them on their minds. And then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Long passage. Let's get to the point. Uh, a friend of mine was asking a art teacher to come and help him learn how to draw. Um, any of you artists, like really good with you know pencils, and, and what he was doing was doing like sketching on pencils with that that paper that's kind of like ribbly, you know. So when you when you stroke across it, it kind of feels like it's sandpaper, but it also makes a really cool mark look on the whole piece of paper. And so she would tell him to draw these things, or like looking out the window or those fun little fruit bowls that remember that in high school um, art class or even junior high art class, making the apple and making the banana just perfect. And it's like, this is, isn't there more, more interesting things to, to draw? Um, but so he was drawing something that was outside of his window. He has a barn outside um, in, his, in his property. And so he was drawing the barn. And, and what the lady would do, and she would do this every time he drew anything, is that she would, he would, she would take a big piece of paper and cut out one square inch in the middle of the piece of paper. And then he would, she would, I can't get the pronouns right. She would look at his picture, kind of scour through it, and then she would take this piece of paper with the one square inch cut into it and overlay it onto one of the things that she found in his picture that were just superb. You know, this place where he had made such perfect use of shading or the, the side of the pencil as opposed to the point of the pencil or when he like had turned the pencil up and kind of made a nice stiff line that, that showed like definition. And, and so she would then go into detail about how amazing that one stroke of the pencil was. Now, the rest of the picture may have been horrible, but she would look at that one square inch and show him and tell him and praise him and encourage him and he said, this is amazing. I knew that the drawing was no good, but when she talked about that one small thing that I did and with such detail that, that made me think that maybe I could do this. Maybe I could be an artist at some point in my life. Now, what I'd like to do is try to take our entire lives as like the drawing that we're creating and, and then be like, uh, I think her name was Alice with a little square. I want to lay that on top of our lives and, and look at one small thing that I think is so wonderful and so superb that even if the rest of the drawing of our lives is horrible, in looking at that one small piece, we can, we can be encouraged, we can be 
courageous. We can look at that and know that, that, that it's possible that our life could, could change and be different and, and we could create an entire picture that, that looks as good as that one little piece. But let's go through the passage, and, and I know it's a long passage, but hopefully you'll begin to see some things that, because it says this, this other thing was a shadow. It, it, you couldn't see it very well. It, was, it, w- it would have been really hard to draw. In fact, if you, if you looked at it, you wouldn't even know where the edges are or, or where you should shade it because it was all shadow. The old system under the law of Moses was only this, this shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. How many of you have ever done the little shadow puppets you know, I just think those, those were always fun when I was a kid and how well that some people could make a dog or make a monkey or a, the butterfly thing was, or a bird or an eagle. You know, you could call it different things as it changed shapes a little bit. But it was always cool. And then, then to think that that whole thing was just made by your hands and a light and it looked so real, but it was just a shadow. You couldn't see any of the detail. That's why you knew it was, or you thought it was something else rather than just a bunch of hands. So this dim preview of things to come from this law of Moses and all these sacrifices that are being made. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year. And he repeats this over and over. He says, they happen constantly, day after day, week after week, month after month, again and again and again. But they were never able to provide Perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. Can you imagine going through all of that trouble, all of those sacrifices, all of the bloody experiences with these poor animals, and you would never get to the point where you were cleansed? It's interesting, when I was looking at the Old Testament and throughout the Bible, really just about about sacrifices, when do sacrifices even show up in the Bible? I mean, do they come up early or are they kind of a late addition to the the whole system? But but really, they're very early in the the Bible. Does anybody remember what the first offering was? Uh, I don't know if you remember the whole Bible, but like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created Adam and Eve, and then uh, they messed up, but Adam and Eve had some kids, dude called Cain and his brother Abel, and at least my understanding from my theologian, Bruce Springsteen, in the Bible, Cain slew Abel, and he was cursed, that, I don't know if I remember right. Um, yeah, so, so that's really what it were, and it's in Genesis 4, it's four chapters into this whole book, when they grew up, this Cain and Abel, who were kids of Adam and Eve, Abel became a shepherd, and Cain cultivated the ground when it was time for the harvest. Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. And so what they actually believe is that there was an altar built and then he brought some of his grain and he put it there and burned it to the Lord. And there was like some smoke. And and we believe that because all the cultures in the world eventually did that. And it's like, where did they start? I mean, these guys are kind of the first ones out of the gate and they were doing it already. They were offering sacrifices up to God. It says, Abel also brought a gift, but Abel's was so much better. He brought the very best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. And it, I mean, think of that, the, the firstborn lamb from the, a blemish-free lamb for God. Sound familiar? And I'm sure it's not foreshadowing, it's not a shadow of anything to come, but who knows? So the Bible says that the Lord looked upon Abel's offering and he accepted it. It was accepted, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. And that, I don't know if you remember, that gets Cain kind of angry and he looks dejected. And God says, why are you looks dejected? If you just give the right thing, I would accept it. But you've given like the weeds and the bad stuff. And, and yet, yet he brought the best, the lamb, the, the perfect lamb to sacrifice to me. And, and I mean, like, he gets mad. Cain gets really, really mad and eventually just kills his brother. And, and it's like, like the first sacrifices led to some of the worst experiences in the world. It's like, I think we just chuck the sacrificial system right now because it se- doesn't seem to be doing very well. But the sacrificial system continued to work in the cultures of the world. I mean, throughout the cultures of the world, in Samaria, where, where the cradle of civilization, where probably these Cain and Abel people grew up, or the people of God, and as they reproduced, all the people of 
world, they, they started offering up these sacrifices. Now, you'd like to say that oh, they all sacrificed to the one true God, but, but the reality is, is they started worshiping other gods, other idols. They, like, they would notice that the, the sun would, would give light to the world, and then it would go away, and then this other ball of light would come, and, and it would give the light to the night, and they they started thinking that, that they were big, they were important, they were worthy of, of worship. And, and so, believe it or not, they started actually giving them names, and they started worshiping them, and they would offer up sacrifices to, like, the sun and the moon and the rain, all the things that it seemed like they needed for, for life, for they needed to depend on to, to get food, or they needed to depend on to, to have rain for their crops, so their crops would grow. There would even be people who would sacrifice things of their crops, thinking that the crops were in some way deity, or, or, and they kept on giving them names. But here's the problem with all that, is that the altar itself, and it, it was just a, a square of, of stones, and oftentimes it had a, like a horn on each edge, that the problem with this, this altar where they offered up these sacrifices is that, say, say the sun came out really, really strong and, and scorched all your plants, and, and the rain like just didn't rain for a long time, and so all your plants died, and then how do you then offer up anything because you, the, the, the sun god just was angry with you, he burned all your crops, the rain god was, must have been angry too, because he didn't offer up his rain, so like, what do we do, what do we do, are they mad at us, I mean, what, what do we, what should we, should we offer them more stuff? And we don't even have, can we offer maybe this dead stuff? We'll throw that up on there. Are you happy with this yet? It, it got to the point where because of their understanding of trying to appease the gods, these idol gods, that they never really knew how much they should offer up. If they had a great bumper crop, it's like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. We should offer him back this much. And well, no, if, if we offer that much the same as we did last year, and, and is he going to think that we're not grateful that he, he gave us this much this year? So let's, let's heap on some more. Yeah, that's enough. Well, no, no, a little bit more. Just make sure he's happy. Or if, if the whole thing went south, if there was no crops, because the the sun scorched the, the crops and there's no rain. It's like, okay, he's really angry. Well, well what do we got left? Um, we don't have any crops. We, uh, how about we, uh, well, we'll, how about we do this? We'll, we'll shed our own blood. We'll, we'll cut ourselves. And there's, um, in the Bible, it talks about the prophets of Baal cutting themselves and bleeding so that, so that they would show their devotion, so they would bleed on the altar. Or it got to the point where sometimes they would take a child and say, well, this child is so important to me, but, but I'll offer this child up. And the detestable God Molech in the Bible, it's, he, he wanted um, child sacrifices. And so this, this altar was so crazy because there was this horrible kind of vortex of... You, you had to keep on giving so much more to this, this God, the sun God, or the moon God, or the rain God, or the thunder God, or the God that took care of the plants, or, or the, the fertility God, so you would have kids. And so all of this stuff was like, created this intense anxiety in the heart and psyche of people. They never knew how much they should give. And, and, um, I was thinking about this because I, I've often met uh, people who are followers of Jesus who kind of act the same way. Um, like every time the doors are open, they're there. They're coming because the doors are open, so they got to be there. And um, like, I don't know if you ever had this, like, on, like on a Monday you see somebody out the mall and they weren't at church on Sunday and they, oh, oh. Uh, uh, Steve, I, you know, we had, um, you know, we had my in-laws in town, and then my flat tire, and then I locked my keys in my truck. Yeah, I've heard that before, and um, and uh, and and it's like, I, you know, I don't care. I don't, I don't mind if there's empty seats. I love the fact that people are there, but, but it's okay. You don't, you don't have to be there. Or, you know, hey, trust me, I, I, I want to serve. And I, you know, I wanna, so, so don't worry. Like, this is kind of a difficult time in my life right now. I'm really busy. But, man, right after that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in there. I'm going to serve. And I'm going to do It's like, yeah, hey, hey, relax, chill. I mean, it's okay. It's, 
You do you. We're, we're fine. It, it seems like some people who follow Jesus fall into the same trap of those who followed idol gods by never knowing when they had done enough. And, and then into that culture, into that system, is, is this crazy experience where, where God speaks to, to a guy named Moses. Now, he's already called Abraham, and he's brought the people out of the, the Chaldeans, and they, they moved a little bit, and then they wound up in Egypt. And so, so they're in Egypt, and they are clearly aware of how the Egyptians are offering all kinds of things up to their sun god and mood god and god of the Nile and the god of the frogs and all those weird plagues that happened in the book of Exodus. Those were all gods that, that, that God was showing, the real true God was showing that I'm more powerful than they are. So they knew what idol worship was all about. They had seen people give all that they could. And God steps in and calls Moses out. He pulls the people out. He takes them in as a community of people. And then he says, hey, listen, I got to believe that you are completely freaked out about this whole sacrificial system. You've watched people for years and years offer more and more and more up to their idol gods, hoping that they would appease them, hoping that the gods would be happy with them. And I just need to tell you, I got to give you something that can just put you at, at peace. And so he literally created a sacrificial system. And I don't know if you've ever read through the book of Leviticus. I think I've read through it like four or five times in the last two months, which is it's a miracle in and of itself. In fact, I really do think that I've appeased God by doing that. No, I'm kidding. Um, in the first five uh, chapters of the book of Leviticus, if you've ever read it, how many of you have read Leviticus? <laughs> you cannot lie in church, man. Okay, okay, fine. How many of you have started reading Leviticus and then you said, okay, I'm done by about chapter five because it's like this horrible B-grade slasher movie where everything's cut there. Kill this and cut this and then chop it here and then cut it here and then burn that stuff and let the blood flow. And it's like, Ugh! it feels like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> it's pretty creepy. Uh, in chapter one, we hear about the, the Ola, the burnt offering, and that is when you take an animal and you basically put the whole thing, I mean, you've already changed things, you've moved things, you've washed things, then you put it up all on the altar and you burn it up to the Lord and the smoke rises up and, and it's like a pleasing aroma to the God, devoting basically the whole self up to God and Ola means to rise or to go up and so the idea is that you're taking everything that you are and you're rising, raising it up to, to God. That's after you've laid your hands on the head and you've, you've kind of confessed your sin and then you burn that all up and it's like, a, okay, in doing that, I'm, I'm offering myself back to you even though I, I know I've messed up and then, and really the Bible says once you've done that, you're good. You're chill, you're good. There's the second one in chapter two is called the minha, and that's more of like a grain offering, and that's like for the cooks, I think. You know, it's like, well, we didn't do so well at the grilling thing, and um, I'm thinking this is me, because Dana always does the grilling outside. So this is more my thing. It's, this is a grain offering, so you get some grain, and you get some flour, and you put a little oil in there, and you bake up a little thing, a little cake, kind of a little tortilla, and then and you give that up to the Lord. And there's no animals, there's no shed blood, but... But it seems to be that it, this was more like a tribute, like an offering that says, you know, I'm just thankful for what you've done for me. It's not about covering over anything, but it's just showing you a gratitude uh, and showing my dedication. The, the third one I think is really important. It's the shalomim, uh, kind of from the word shalom, and it means to have peace with God. And so the idea was that you would present an animal at the temple, but instead of like slicing and dicing the whole thing. It was more like butchering it. You'd cut off the bad stuff, but you'd keep all the good portions of the meat because the reality was you were going to eat this stuff. You were going to grill it up after you sacrificed all the innards and the gross stuff. Then you were going to sit down with the priests and your family and your friends, and you were going to celebrate the fact that you, because of this offering, you now know that you have peace with God. There is nothing more you have to do. You have peace with him. And so it was a celebration of that peace where you could rest in his presence and know we are okay. 
The fourth one, chapter four, is the hata offering. That really is the sin offering, and that's animals, and you're laying your hand on their head, and basically for unintentional sins, things you didn't realize you did, or maybe never even thought or, or remember that you did, but you did it so that God would be pleased with that one, and now the person would be ritually pure once again, and so they could go into the temple and once again like encounter God and, and hang out with God. And then the last one is the asham offering. The, and this is more about sins that you remembered you did. Like you were thinking about things that had happened yesterday and you went, oh, you know what? That was, that was wrong of me. I, I, just, uh, I can't believe I did that. I need to make amends for that. And so what you would do is you would offer up some sacrifice and then you would actually take um, whatever you did to harm somebody, you'd take all the money that that would cost to replace that and then add 20%. So you, you were making amends, but then you were also offering up restitution. There was a debt to be paid, and that was the idea that sin hurt people. And there was a debt to be paid when you, when you sinned. And so those are the, the kind of the five offerings. And those offerings then go on throughout the book of Leviticus in the Day of Atonement. There's some offerings there with a couple goats. And, and constantly showing the fact that, that there needs to be an offering made to God. But once you've done it, there was peace. There was no longer this anxiety that riddled you. You could just rest. Okay, me and God are fine. Completely different than most of the cultures of that day when they would realize, oh my gosh, have I done enough? I should throw on more. I mean, I should take my kid. I should take my wife. Really, take my wife. Um, that's a, it's a Rodney Dangerfield joke, I think. Um, when is enough? Maybe I could cut myself and shed my own blood. Maybe, maybe I should sacrifice myself. Maybe I've, I'm never going to do enough. Maybe, maybe I'm never going to be made right with this God that I'm trying to appease. But the one true God says, no, no, no. I've set up a system so that you can know that you are at peace. It's done. Now, that was the sacrificial system. That was the system in the Old Testament. But the Bible says in Hebrews that it was just a shadow of something that was yet to come. Verse 2, we went a long way from that verse 1. Don't worry, we're not going there that much anymore. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, meaning all of those sacrifices, the Ola, the Minha, the Shalemim, the Asham, and the Hata, those sacrifices, those offerings, if those could have provided perfect cleansing, then the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, meaning, okay, if we did it, and it took care of this thing, we don't have to do it anymore. But in fact, it was done over and over and over, and the feelings of guilt that the people had never disappeared. Like you would go and sacrifice that thing for, for, for the thing that you did to that person, even it was unintentional, and, and then you would offer up that extra 20% to make restitution for it, but then you, you still, in some way, for whatever reason, still felt this, this guilt. It never could take away the guilt in someone's conscience. The anxiety, yes, you knew that you were right, but the guilt that was leveled on you just weighed there their feelings of guilt would have disappeared if those sacrifices would have been good enough, but they weren't. They were never able to provide perfect cleansing. But instead, and I think this is so amazing, instead, verse 3 says, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sinfulness. Year after year, day after day, week after week, they were offering these things up to God, knowing that they were right with God, but they still, because they were offering them so often, they were doing it for the same things over and over. They were reminded that, oh my gosh, I am sinful to the core. There is so much guilt on me, and it is never taken away. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but some pastors play this really well. You know, um, right now, there are 14 babies in, in two nurseries. And, and right now, there are only three people watching them. And, and, and I don't know how you can sit there in your seats knowing that 11 little babies are just laying on the floor. 
And they are not experiencing the love of Jesus like they should be. And so who would like to, I ask you, (laughs) who wants to go watch a baby right now and assuage the guilty conscience in your soul? Now, I don't, right, we don't ever do that. We could. I think Josh would be good at it. <laughs> Although I've proven I can do it too. Um, have you ever had somebody lay a guilt trip on you for what you weren't, what you couldn't? Yeah, that happens. See, I think the old system is often kind of moved into and co ops the new system. These sacrifices reminded them of their sins. Reminded them of their sins. How how hard is it for you to remember your sin? I I mean, we have different personalities and stuff, but but are you one who kind of dwells on it? Dwells on your mistakes? People who are perfectionists, oh my gosh, I can't, I did that wrong, it was horrible. Um... I, I don't think we really need anyone to, to continually remind us of our sins. The beauty of it is we do have the Holy Spirit who convicts us of our sins and moves us to the cross so they can be taken away, but it doesn't mean that we should hold on to them or dwell on them. In fact, the Bible says that there's an enemy of our souls who kind of accuses us day and night. He constantly tells us what we've done wrong. I was uh, Years ago, I was in seminary, cemetery, seminary, whatever, um, seminary, <laughs> learning how to be a pastor. And a friend of mine, I've probably told this story a number of times. Sorry if you've heard it. A friend of mine said, hey, I'm working with a guy and I think he's, I think there's something wrong with him. I mean, he seems a little um, unfocused and he says some weird things sometimes. He blurts things out. And I went, "Um, what, will you you meet with him? It's like, yeah, sure. What am I going to do? And so I met with him, went to his house out in Oregon and by BP whatever that is. Um, And the guy said to me, after rattling off a number of things that I had done, he says, and you call yourself a Christian after you've done those things. And I was like, ah. One, how do you know I did those things? Two, don't bring them up in front of Jim. (laughs) And three, I think I know who you are. And I said, I'm going to pray. (laughs) I prayed. And I said, Jim, I need to go. And we were out of there. But but he reminded me of my sin. And I think it was like there was something really weird going on there. The Holy Spirit instead comes, convicts us of our sins, says, oh, that, that wasn't good. And you immediately say, you're right. I confess that. Thank you, Jesus, that you've taken that away. See how that's different? How sin kind of affects us differently? If we're, we're filled with the Spirit or, or we're, we're kind of condemning ourselves already, I mean, there are different ways of doing that. But what it says in the text, it says, there is no chance that the old sacrifice, sacrificial system, the blood of bulls and goats, it's, there's no possible way that it could ever take away sins. In fact, Romans says it's not about taking away the sins. In fact, God was just holding back his wrath when he did those things. And it was done over and over and over. He was just, he was just holding back. that There was going to be a time when sin was going to be punished for, but, but it wasn't yet because those animals were continually flowing with their blood so the people were ceremonially, outwardly clean. But never, they never had the sense that they were right with God internally. Their conscience was always struggling. They always felt that guilt. Now, verse 5, and this is great because it takes some of the Old Testament passages of Scripture, and the Jewish people would have known, oh, I've read that before. That's about Jesus? Oh, no, you're, that's awesome. Psalm 40, and this author and then puts the words of Psalm 40 or into the, the lips of Jesus. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, and that's all those offerings that we talked about, but you have given me a body to offer. I'm supposed to be the one who offers myself. I'm going to be the sacrifice. You are not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. And then I said, meaning putting it in the lips of Jesus, he says, look, I have come to do your will. I'm going to obey. 
I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do everything right, and I'm still then going to go as a sacrifice, as it is written about me in the scriptures. And then the author kind of explains this. Do you understand what this means? When, when David wrote this psalm, he was putting it in the mouth of the Messiah, Jesus. First, Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, the hata offerings or burnt offerings, the ola offerings or other offerings, the minha, the asham or anything, nor were you pleased with them, though they're required by the law of Moses. In fact, it's in the book of Leviticus. You're supposed to do it over and over, day after day, week after week. Keep on doing it. But it didn't please God. It didn't appease God. It didn't render his anger towards sin Moot. And then he said, Jesus saying, look, I have come to do your will. And then he cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will, and this is a great passage, for God's will, this is what he wanted for all time. From the very beginning of time, he wanted us to be made holy. God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. I mean, it's, I just love that because it's, now the next verse is going to kind of really capture this, but, but he just, just suppose, like, okay, the priests are there day after day standing, cutting the necks, cutting the necks, cutting the guts, throwing it up on the thing, burning it. Here, another one, cut the neck, cut the guts, wash. It's like constant. It's like, oh my gosh. It's like working at a factory, but it's gross. You know, it's like a, well, no, I won't say that. Um, under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. I mean, you got to wonder. It's like, okay, so, so Jesus came. He died on the cross. He then came back and talked to his folks and then like, a number of days later, he poof, he's off and he's gone. He said at the right hand of God, he's still looking down at the priest. Really? Are you really going to cut the neck of that bull and that goat and that sheep and throw the things up on the altar? Are you really going to do that? You are going to continue to do that? I've handled it. It's done. Did it one time. It's over. Why do you keep on doing it day after day, hour after hour, week after week? That's not what God wants. That can never wipe away sin. That can never clear the conscience. It can never make your soul assuaged of the guilt. It's funny. In the beginning of the passage, the beginning of the Bible, or the book of Hebrews, he says the same thing. He says this, this Jesus who has come in the flesh is the, the, the perfect radiance of God's glory and the, the exact image of his likeness. He is, he's just like God, but in the flesh. And, and yet all of those little parts of describing who Jesus is all point to this one little passage in verse 3. When he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down. The book starts off with the idea that when Jesus gave his life for us, it was over. He could rest. He could sit down because the whole thing was done. He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven, and now he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. And here's the most important verse of the whole passage. For by that one offering, Jesus giving his life on the cross, he forever, meaning eternally, meaning this is never going to end he forever made perfect. This is one action done in the past. He made us perfect. He made us perfect. I know. Shocker, right? You are perfect because of what Christ has done. You are forever perfect in God's sight because what Christ has done for us. And he made us perfect. And he is continually then helping us through his Holy Spirit to become holy, to become just like Jesus. But you are perfect right now. There's no more sacrifices. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. But it was the Lord's plan. This is from Isaiah. This idea of even in the Old Testament, the picture of Jesus coming as the Messiah to give his life was there. 
It was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. Isn't it great to know that he's satisfied? And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all of their sins. The Bible continues to say that he will now put his Holy Spirit in you and the Holy, the Holy Spirit will write his word on your heart and in your mind so that you will be able to, to follow him. The Old Testament folks never had that capability. They were always in the flesh. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to help them live according to the word of God. And then he says, I will never again remember their sin and lawless deeds. When sins have been forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. <clears throat> you know, we've been talking a lot about how the Old Testament passage, or the Old Testament sacrifices always reminded the people of their sins. But yet Christ's death on the cross is the way of reminding us that all of our sins are completely wiped away. Now, isn't that amazingly different? Like, you go to church and you say, oh, shoot, I'm still sinful, I'm still horrible, I'm reminded of my horrible nature, my sin. Or you go to church and somebody says, guess what? Because of what Jesus has done, you are absolutely perfect. You can look at the life and especially the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection from the dead and you can know for certain that you have no sin connected to you at all. You are completely clean. You are completely perfect. And we've talked about this like... <clears throat> That's not the experience of many people that I know in the Christian life. They walk around feeling guilty about things. And so we just said, you know what we're going to do is we're going to let people, every time they come to church, remember what Christ has done. And so what we do that is, as, as Christians is that we, we go to the communion table. We, we remember what Jesus has done for us by, by taking the bread, knowing that his body was broken, and taking the juice knowing that his blood was shed once, just one time for all of us and for all of our sin. We're going to move into a time of worship. And so what I would like you to do is prepare your hearts. Has there ever been a point in your life where you felt guilty about something? I know you think, are you serious? Do you realize that there's never a time as a follower of Jesus, there should be about a three-second interval where you are convicted of sin and, and know, okay, Christ paid for that. I might have to go make amends, but now it's over. So I want you to just think of a time when, when maybe you've done something and you felt that guilt. And hold that before the Lord for a second. <clears throat> now, the old sacrifices couldn't have done anything for that. They couldn't have touched that. But Christ's death on the cross, the breaking of his body, the shedding of his blood, cleansed you completely, and not just outwardly, but inwardly. Cleaned your conscience, cleaned your soul, so that you can stand before God perfect. Now, as we worship, I want to invite you, you don't have to, and I just want you to know from now on, we're always going to invite you during the second set of worship to go and be reminded that your sin is completely wiped away. So if you've done something throughout the week and you walk in here and it's reminded, you say, no, Holy Spirit, move me to be reminded that, that this is gone, that this has been wiped away, that Jesus is one sacrifice wiped away this completely forever. There's two sets and it's in the corner and that's where it'll be every week from now on, at least for the next little time period, the season of our life. Because we want you all to know that no matter what you've done, you are forgiven forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good.
your death on the cross as full payment for our sin. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would, would etch that on our soul, that we are clean, we are perfect. When you look at us, you see us as holy. And thank you for that. And I pray over each person here who is struggling maybe with a, a feeling of guilt. Cast it away. Take it away. Allow them to understand the truth that this new sacrifice has cleansed them forever and they're perfect in your sight. Father, we worship you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand to worship?